Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. I know you all came uh, from different parts of the country all just to see me, so I really do appreciate that. Um, today, what we want to do is talk through uh, some of the psychology, some of the, the way that we handle breaches and specifically ransomware. In today's uh, environment, this is honestly probably one of the top threats that people, you know, when they think cybersecurity, most people will gravitate towards ransomware. And so for us, having a way to analytically evaluate and then respond is absolutely critical. And it's something that for a lot of us, we, we may not necessarily do. It's a very emotion-based uh, decision for a lot of organizations. Now before I dive in, um, a little bit about me. I uh, started my career in Big Four Consulting, was there for about uh, seven years before founding Triton in 2018. Um, and then uh, from there, we've been continuing to serve uh, clients both from small and medium-sized companies all the way up to the Fortune 50. I deal primarily in uh, incident response planning, disaster recovery, risk mitigation, compliance, um, those types of things. Again, things that are very relevant when it comes to responding. But most importantly for this topic, uh, I've also been playing poker since I was about 13 years old on a ski trip with a bunch of Pringles. So, uh, as we're talking through this, what I want to do is really kind of put the context around uh, the response process in the very similar manner that we would approach the final table of a poker tournament. Now, before I get started, I have to put the legalese in here that is, uh, your mileage may vary, do this at your own risk, blah, 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 blah. Um, please consult with your attorneys before taking any of my advice because uh, your specific situation may be different and or uh, nuanced in a way that I cannot tell you. But with that, let's jump into it. So at this point, we're going to assume that everybody has been hit with a ransomware breach. This was an incredibly effective one. Everybody's data is encrypted. Everybody's operations are completely stopped. And we now have to figure out what is going on and what we're going to do about it. Now, just like in a uh, poker game, we have a couple of options here. If somebody has made a bet, in this case, our ransomware attacker has actually come in. They've encrypted our data. They've basically pushed a bunch of chips into the pot. And we are now looking at them and saying, how are we going to respond? Now, I'm not talking about the technical response here. I'm strictly thinking about how are we mentally going to move through the process of a response. Now, hopefully, we've got an incident response plan, but if we don't, there's still ways that we can kind of contextualize this and think about what our next steps are going to be. Generally speaking, we have three options. Option one, we can call. Again, in the poker world, this is gonna be, we're gonna push the exact number of chips in, we're gonna keep playing, or we're gonna show our hands. And in response characteristic, and for today, we're gonna to be saying that we're gonna pay the ransom, and we're going to see what they actually got and what we can get back. Option two is going to be we can raise. We can push even more chips into the pot, right? We can see if they chicken out, if they're bluffing, if they really have the goods. For our purposes, this is going to be, we're going to say, you know what, we don't want to pay. We think that we can recover on our own. Maybe we've got some really good backups. Maybe we've got offline systems that weren't impacted. Maybe we've got really good network segmentation. So a number of ways that we can look at this, but ultimately, we are going to go it alone. And then finally, we're going to fold. We say, I'm out, I'm good, don't need to pay anymore. I already know you've got me beat. It's not worth the extra investment. For us, that will be basically the nuke and pave method, right? We say, I'm, I'm just not even gonna try to recover. We're going to just completely go over everything that we've got, and we're gonna start from scratch. So those are our three options. Now, before I start talking about what each of these look like and kind of how we evaluate which of these is most appropriate, I think I kind of need to address the elephant in the room. And that is that most people, immediately when they hear there's been a ransomware attack or they're being asked to pay a ransom, they immediately go to, I don't negotiate with terrorists, I'm not going to pay, that's immoral, we're not going to do that. Let's talk about where that came from. Back in 1973, there was a hostage, or a hostage situation in the Saudi embassy, and there were three uh, Western hostages taken. Uh, there were about 12 total, but three, three Westerners, two Americans, one Belgian. The U.S. government was in the process of getting in touch with the kidnappers or the, the terrorists 
and starting the negotiation process like we have done for years and years and years. However, that night, Richard Nixon went on, on TV, had a press conference, and very determinately and confidently said the United States does not negotiate with terrorists. 12 hour, hours later, all three Western hostages were dead. The other nine that were uh, from countries that were willing to pay the ransom were eventually returned. When we start making absolute statements, we force ourselves into a very extreme outcome. We either get all of our data, we get none of our data. We either get our hostages back and they're alive, or they end up dead. It can be a very polarizing discussion, and it's one that as we have over the last 50 years entrenched in our mental framework for how we respond to these things. So as we talk about this, we need to be considering a couple of things. Now, there are moral standards that we all in this room, hopefully, agree to, one of which being that we want to be doing as little harm overall to society as we can. Now, in a ransomware instance, it's not as cut and dry. We're not talking about, in most cases, we're not talking about people's lives. Maybe we're, we're talking about their livelihoods. Maybe we're talking about customers not uh, getting the services that they rely on. Maybe we're talking about our employees. Maybe we're talking about other things like that. But in general, we're, we're not talking about life and death situations. But what if we are? What if it's a hospital that's been hit? What if it's an uh, air traffic controller and there are people in the, in the air at that time that may or may not be able to get down safely? There are times where we look at this and we say, is it moral for me not to pay the ransom just out of principle rather than pay it and immediately get back and be able to continue performing life-saving operations? This is something we have to consider. It's something we have to talk about. It may be that I'm looking at those types of stakes, and again, we look at healthcare as a great example. If I'm not able to understand a patient's history, if I can't see what they're allergic to, and they are given medication that sends them into anaphylactic shock, I would argue that's probably worse and more evil than me paying $50,000 to get my systems back up and running. But that's a decision that you and me and all of our IT professionals have to make, and hopefully we can make it ahead of time so it's not something that we're trying to figure out in the heat of the moment. Now, the other thing that people will say here is, well, let's, let's talk for a minute about paying the ransom because the minute that you pay the ransom, you're encouraging more bad behavior. You're encouraging more people to get hit, right? In a traditional breach, how are the attackers getting paid? Usually, they're going to go in, they're going to try to be as sneaky as possible, they're going to pull data out, they're then going to have to go and find a buyer, likely on dark web, black market, whatever. They're going to negotiate with that buyer, that broker, there might be another set of, um, another set of negotiations that happen to get that from a broker into another third party who then turns it into, a, you know, for example, turns credit card numbers into physical cards that they go and actually buy stuff from Best Buy. You know, they start getting a bunch of these big screen TVs and all of that that we saw with a couple of big name breaches in the last past few years. But in each step of that process, that value of that, or the value of that data goes down, right? We all know every time money changes hands, a little bit, a little bit of it goes missing, right? So for the attacker, they may be saying, hey, I've got a, I could sell this for $5 million, that's the straight up value of it for whatever metric we're using, but I, have to, I can only charge $4 million to the next guy because he's got to make a profit as well, right? You add on to that the fact that as we start looking at the timeline of those attacks, the chance of discovery goes up. Again, if I'm thinking about the, the credit card numbers, right? Let's say I steal a million credit card numbers the amount of time that goes by, or the more time that goes by, the greater the chance that the victim is gonna realize that, they notify the card brands, and boom, all of those cards can pretty much instantly be changed and, and wiped, and suddenly the attacker gets nothing. So the, the risks and the financial incentives for attackers in, tr in traditional breaches 
is oftentimes a very um, quick to market and risky position because they could walk away with nothing. Now let's flip that around to a ransomware attack. Who values your data and your operations more than you? Probably nobody. So when we start talking about who the customer is for an attack like this, suddenly we're talking about a very financially incentivized victim, customer, whatever you want to talk about, or however you want to phrase it, and we're talking about them in a way that they're dealing directly with the attacker. They're cutting out all the middlemen. So there's already a greater chance that that attacker is going to get what they are looking for, or at least a larger portion of what they're looking for. We then add on to the fact that a lot of these attacks are now basically double dipping, and they're still stealing the data, and they're just saying, you pay me to get your operations back up. Well, A, if you don't address the root cause, I'm just gonna do it again. Or B, I'm gonna sell all of your data anyways, or I'm gonna release all of your data. Maybe it's source code, maybe it's you know, fill in the blank with proprietary data. So there's a lot of different ways that that attacker can then monetize that attack. And so the argument of if we pay, then you're just going to encourage more, I would honestly argue that they're already being encouraged to do more just by the nature of these attacks. Now, that does not mean, and do not hear me, I've, I'm sure this will end up on Twitter somewhere with Brandon said that we should just pay and it's all fine, but there are already incentives. The horse is already out of the barn, genie out of the bottle, again, metaphor you would like to use there. But it's important for us to recognize that at some point, whether or not we pay is kind of irrelevant. These guys are going to be doing this more anyways. So for us to put, again, some of those obligations and those um, potential risks for our customers, for the other people in society, because we don't want to encourage bad behavior, yeah, that's probably true to some extent, but we need to recognize that there's already an encouragement for these types of attacks just by the very nature of the financial model. So that brings me back to, okay, We've talked about the morals, we've talked about the encouragement, all of that. We realize that there are going to be certain incentives. What, what do we actually do here, right? How do we make the decision that we just talked about at the beginning of call, raise, fold? Well, like any good degenerate gambler, there's a couple of things that we have to look at here. Starting with who the person sitting across from us is. If you've ever played poker, you probably know or you probably heard the phrase, you don't play the cards, you play the player across from you. It's very similar here. The second thing that we're gonna look at is what's actually in the pot, right? It doesn't make sense for us to go in and spend a million dollars for a $50,000 pro uh, problem. City of Atlanta, um, my home city, uh, made a great uh, example of what not to do in a lot of cases uh, a couple years back when rather than paying a $50,000 uh, ransom, they said, no, we've got this, and they ended up spending almost $3 million on remediation and uh, restoration. From a business perspective, it's government. What do you expect? And then finally, we talk about what we actually have in our hands. What are the outs that we have? What are the controls that we have? How do those all play together in such a way that we are able to either recover or, again, say, I'm out? So let's break these down. Now, the first thing that we need to do is understand, again, who's across from us. There are going to be times where legally you cannot pay. So it's all kind of a moot point. Congrats, my talk's over. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one, right? The foreign, Office of Foreign Assets and Control basically has a list of bad guys that they don't want you to pay because it can finance terrorism. It can fill in the blank with, again, whatever nefarious activities we're talking about here but there are some times where you just legally cannot pay. If this is the case, congratulations, you're back to where you started, no harm, no foul. It is very important that when you are going through this, you are, or going through this process, that you are in constant communication with, again, your legal teams, with your incident responders, threat intelligence, all of the people that can help you make these decisions so that you can understand, hey, if we make this payment, you know, it's less than ideal, we don't wanna talk about it, we're not gonna notify the news or whatever. 
but we're also not going to get fined and or you know, have somebody sent to jail. If that happens, again, make sure that when you're looking at these types of negotiations, you're working with somebody that has experience, you're talking with people who know the ins and outs of the legalese, and again, you're not going to land yourself in even more trouble for trying to get out of a bad situation. Now with that being said, who's actually doing this, right? We're seeing a lot of uh, attacks coming out of North Korea and Iran, um, specifically uh, countries that have been hit hard with sanctions. Um, you're seeing a lot of state-sponsored ransomware from that. Um, you're also seeing, obviously, a lot of the organized crime uh, with the Russia-Ukraine conflict. That kind of died down for a little bit. Um, it's coming back. Um, there's been a number of different botnets, things like that, that have kind of come back up or spun back up in the last couple of months. And so you are seeing some of these groups um, kind of rise from the ashes, I guess. Um, you're also seeing them kind of come in and out. Uh, a lot of the uh, organizations that are getting a lot of notoriety tend to kind of go down, wait for the, the heat to die off, and then we'll come back up. Uh, we saw this with like Darkseid, for example, after they hit Colonial Pipelines. They went quiet, they said they disbanded, whatever. Now we're seeing Black Cat uh, coming back as a different variant, but looks and feels very, very similar to what we saw with Darkseid. So some people are actually saying, hey, that's probably the same group or that's the same, uh, same source or, or whatever it is. Some of these other ones, again, you'll kind of see coming in and out and it really does depend on uh, where in the world, what type of, or what type of uh, sector, anything like that. And so there are a lot of um, kind of ins and outs here as we're, we're talking about who's doing what. And again, attribution is always hard and we really enjoy doing it, but half the time we're wrong. Now, when it comes to who's actually doing this, why does it matter, right? Like, why does it matter if I'm talking about Dark Side versus Black Cat or uh, Conti or, you know, an Iranian state actor? Why does it matter? Well, because just like in traditional business, certain organizations are better at serving their customers than others. For us, that means that there are certain organizations that if we work with them, if we negotiate with them, we are more likely to get our data back, our operations back. Dark side, again, Colonial Pipelines, they have actually, um, I'm not gonna say perfected because that feels like I'm giving them credit where I probably shouldn't, but they have done a very good job of turning this into what feels like a legitimate business. They have support lines. They offer guarantees. I don't know if they're gonna give you your money back, but you know, there's, there's some level of assurance there that they will help you if you pay. Why are they doing this? Well, like any business, you are more likely to get a customer if you are offering those types of guarantees, if you have a reputation. So when we start looking at the way that these groups operate, the ones that are having a higher success rate, the ones that we're seeing with having um, more support, right? Rather than it just being, you've got a, a big lock screen and everything's gonna, you know, gonna explode if you don't pay me, you know, the sky is falling, all that. The ones that are actually helping customers and setting up that, that two-way communication are seeing more payouts. Again, we can argue whether or not that's the, um, I'll say the moral side of things, but just from a strict business perspective, it makes a lot of sense. Now, this is where we also need to start talking about threat intelligence and how are we using what is actually in our, um, in our toolbox, if you will, to understand who these people are, how they're operating. You can look at a pretty website or you know, a support ticket, whatever it is, but it's really important for us to actually understand this. And so again, this is where talking with people who have worked with these groups before, um, who have helped negotiate settlements or negotiate payments, um, and really just seeing kind of what's in the market is really, really critical. Now, we talked about the first piece, which is who is across the table from you. Now it's important for us to actually talk about what's in the pot. In poker, there's a term called pot odds. Basically what this means is I want to know if I bet $10, what am I actually trying to win? 
right? What's, what's there, what's available for me to win? Basically, again, you kind of see here, $20 in the pot, somebody throws 10 bucks in extra, I then have a one to three or a 10 to 30 uh, ratio of what's in the pot versus what I would have to bet. So when we start talking about the, um, uh, when we start talking about the actual costs that we have to account for, we've obviously got the traditional ones. Uh, things that we look at and we say, okay, you know, infrastructure, I've got to put something in here uh, to rebuild my servers. Uh, I need to actually pay ransom. There's a direct cost there. Uh, maybe this is the time of my people, right? We then also got the indirect costs that are a little bit harder to quantify. Maybe things like lost revenue, human life, um, data reconstruction costs, potential future litigation, all these different things that can go into that uh, kind of overall sentiment. Now this is all fun and I can keep talking about it for a long time, but I figured we could actually take a uh, example that's close to home, and that is the breach that happened in the University of California in San Francisco. Our great host city was unfortunately also the victim of a ransomware attack. Now this was back in, 20, in 2020. Um, they uh, released a statement saying that as part of the attack, uh, the data that was encrypted is important to some of the academic work we pursue as a university for serving the public good. Now, they did say that this was not impacting any of the health systems or healthcare, um, but, and I know this is kind of hard to see, if you look at the academic work, and this is based off of the budget that they, uh, budget and revenue projections that they have, uh, the educational activities, uh, which again, academic work is kind of where we're going with this, was about thir uh, 317 million dollars in annual revenue. They also had uh, grants, they had uh, contracts, things like that, that would go all the way up to about $2 billion, all right? Now again, they didn't specifically say which of these were, uh, were impacted, but if we kind of read between the lines here and make some educated guesses, we can say that let's, you know, either 300 and change or $2 billion. Either way, it's a lot of money. Now, the settlement here, or the, I'm sorry, the payment was a little over a million dollars. So here's where we start kind of doing the, the fuzzy math, right? If you think about your time and your people's time, 50 weeks a year, five days a week, we have 250 days, all right? If you are out for 1% of that, that's two and a half days. How many of us feel like we could completely recover from a ransomware breach in two, two and a half days? Probably not, not many. At that point, you're still just trying to get your heart rate down. So if we start talking about that, we can basically calculate and say, okay, there was a 3.1% would be $3.17 million. They paid one, one point whatever. We're looking at about a 35% payout or three to one odds. You can then extrapolate that all the way down and say if we had that $2 billion and we're out for basically a month, you're looking at almost $200 million of potential lost revenue. Again, at that point, a million bucks? Yeah, I think, I think any business leader would say, if I pay you a million dollars now, I will save 200 million. I think most of our leadership would probably say, yes, let's do that, right? So those are the types of pot odds and those are the types of calculations that we need to be able to make. Now, with that being said, we also have to calculate what are the actual chances of us getting something back, right? It doesn't matter what the pot odds are if when I look at this I say there's no way that I'm gonna get all of it. So with some of these uh, companies that I'm sure nobody has heard of, um, they've done a little bit of research for us. Uh, they've said things like, 99% get some of the encrypted data back, it's from Sophos. Only 4% got all of their data back. The average time typically is between a month to one to three months. I would argue that it's based off of my experience with some of our clients, that's probably closer to the month and a half, two months is really kind of when you start seeing everybody completely back. And so it's really hard for you to be able to, to, to quantify this because again, a lot of this is confidential data. Um, but there are ways that we can kind of make some rough estimates. Again, this is also where it goes back to the threat intelligence, making sure that we're thinking about who actually are we dealing with and what are the rates that they give data back. Now, as one other example here, 
Again, uh, something that I'm sure is near and dear to a lot of people because we have uh, all traveled here. Uh, the Southwest outage was not a ransomware breach. Let me be very clear about that. That is not what I am saying here. But as an example, if you just look at the numbers, they had $60,000 per canceled flight. They had over 16,500 flights canceled. Again, if you went to the CEO of Southwest and you said, hey, I can make this problem go away for a million dollars, how many of us think that he would have said, nope, not gonna do it, just out of principle? Now, how do we actually know what is in the pot? What, what's at risk here? Well, we've got a couple of different tools. Uh, at Triton, we will do what we call a ransomware impact analysis. Um, and this is where we actually will use a tool developed by one of our business partners um, to simulate a breach and see how far the attackers would get. Now, this is really nice because I can't tell you how many times I've heard somebody say, oh, that would never happen because fill in the blank with whatever control you'd like, right? You say, no, it actually did. Here's, here's the evidence, here's the map, here's all of the, the fun uh, graphics and all that. So we can very confidently say this is how far it could get, this is how bad it could be. This is what you would have in the pot. We then take that data and we talk about, okay, so let's look at what actually got hit and what that would cost us. If our active directory is down and everything is down, we're losing $50,000 a, a day. If our CRM is down, we can't get in touch with customers or we, we don't have the, the data that we need to help close deals, that's gonna cost us another seven grand. Then we've got just the fines, you know, again, let's say it's PCI data, we're getting hit with a million dollar fine, that's another thing that we need to put in here if that data gets out or if that data is exposed. So there's ways that we then quantify and put all this into perspective. Now, after we've done that analysis, we then say, okay, what are our outs? In poker, this means basically, what is the next card, what are the chances that the next card is going to improve my hand? Here, we've got three hearts on the flop. I've got another heart in my hand. So my odds or my outs are that I could get anything to make a flush, four or five, spades, clubs, diamonds, uh, to get a straight, so on and so forth. Basically things that, again, kind of help me understand where, uh, where I am and what I would be able to get to improve that hand. Now in the IT world, this is that there, there may be some other things that we can do. Things like having backups uh, that are air-gapped or immutable backups, and that's kind of the, the fancy buzz term that I hear a lot of people saying. The redundant architecture or infrastructure in the cloud. Um, this is one that a lot of our clients are doing right now as well. Um, even if they're just setting up the AMIs or some of the, uh, the base images that they would need, um, having that so that they can press a button and spin everything up um, has become incre increasingly popular. Um, you may be able to decrypt it on your own um, or with someone like the FBI that's helping you. Um, the FBI does have um, decryption keys from a lot of different mal malware variants from breaches over the years. They may be able to give you the, the keys to decrypt the data on your own. And then finally, uh, the vendor agreements and outsourcing. Again, if you cannot perform something, having a vendor who might be able to help you can be a, an incredibly powerful way for you to keep business going and mitigate some of the damage, especially if you're talking about uh, like a vendor agreement, an SLA, something like that. Something you'd be thinking about and considering, but it really only helps you if you've already talked through this and understood it before you get hit. Again, at that point, you don't have a whole lot of leverage. If you're in the middle of a fire drill, it can be even more cost prohibitive to try to get some of those agreements in place. Now, there's one other thing that we need to talk about here, and that is, Maybe I just fold, right? Maybe it is time for me to say, I'm out. There are going to be times where we look at the data and we say, you know what, you got my mailing list. Hurts, but whatever. I don't need it. I can do, I've got, I've got my customer data. My reps know their, uh, you know, know their customers. Um, we'll just rebuild it. You may also say, Hopefully this doesn't apply to anybody in this room, but may also say, okay, I guess I'm out of business. There are times where the cost of doing business is just no longer worth it. Maybe you're in a really low margin industry. Maybe you're like my father-in-law who says, I'm doing this just kind of to have something to do. If it's gonna cost me a million dollars to recover everything, go to the range and hit balls all, all day, right? I mean, there, there's a certain level there that you just say, 
it's not worth it. And so that's something that we have to think about, and we have to say, at what point is this too painful for me to try to get back? Again, maybe, maybe it's not we're going out of business, but it could be very much that we're saying we're not gonna try to get this data back. And that's a, that's, that's a reasonable, uh, reasonable response for a lot of people. Now, as we start talking about the response, as we start talking about where do I need to actually go with this, right? There's a couple of things that we want to talk through. And the first is that regardless of the situation, you want to get help. Unless you are a breach response company, which some of you might be, you're probably not, or you probably don't, have the in-house expertise to be able to fully look through all of this and say, yes, we can handle this on our own. This might include things like, again, getting legal counsel, negotiators, uh, law enforcement, all of those different groups of people who can really help you understand this is what I need to do, this is the next step, these are the, the legal implications, and make that risk-aware decision. In some cases, you can get these people ahead of time. This is something we help clients with all the time, is setting up an incident response plan, knowing who we're gonna call. Saying, hey, here's four lawyers that, that we would recommend talking to, getting them maybe on retainer, maybe it's getting them with a zero dollar SOW, just knowing who we are going to have so that when we need to hit the panic button, we can immediately get those people in very quickly and we're able to respond because ultimately seconds matter in a lot of these cases. Now, the other thing that I will say here again is that it is absolutely critical that you do take as much of the emotion out of this as possible by looking at some of this ahead of time. Again, we don't want to be responding or trying to figure out the response during the response, right? Sounds self-explanatory, but it's amazing how many people will jump into something and say, oh crap, we didn't have an incident response plan, or our incident response plan is five years, 10 years out of date, we're not even using Windows 95 anymore, right? I wish I was kidding, I've literally seen that in the IR plan, but, Neither here nor there. So talking with that, understanding again what everything is ahead of time will save you a lot of time and heartache during the actual response. Now the second step here is that again, we do need to understand who we're dealing with. Now this is where again, attribution can be more of an art than a science, but a lot of these groups will also straight up tell you, hey, you've been hit by Conti, right? probably guess who hit me at that point, you know? Like, even I can figure that out. But understanding what I do with that and saying, okay, what are they known for? What are my odds of actually getting my data back? What is the process that they typically go through? Like, again, are they giving me a support line? What are, the, what are their Yelp reviews, you know? <laughs> we're, we're having to try to figure some of this stuff out so that we can see who we're dealing with and where we go. The third thing, is that we want to make sure that we can identify what we actually have in the pot, what's actually been impacted. And again, this sounds kind of stupid because you say, well, if I've been hit, every like, I know what's down, I know what's not working, right? Well, a lot of cases, the attackers have been in the, the environment for typically about 10 to 11 months. It's kind of the, the data that we're seeing right now. They're, they're taking their time, they're going low and slow, they're infecting as much of the network as they possibly can, and in some cases, they're intentionally not detonating payloads before, or I'm sorry, they're not detonating the full payload, they're detonating maybe 80% of it and then leaving either some back doors or leaving malware in other parts of the network to where you think that you've got it up and going, they can kind of see how far you're willing to go and they'll either detonate that again and really make things bad, or they'll save it for later. Basically give themselves an opportunity to reinfect you after the case. Conti is, is known for doing this. Um, they've actually uh, got the highest rate of reinfection, um, and a lot of experts have uh, postulated that that is because, again, they're leaving things uh, undetonated so that they can uh, hit you multiple times once they know that you're going to pay. Again, that's something that's important for you to recognize so that if you are going to be making those payments, you know kind of what you're getting into. 
Now, we need to assess our hand and understand what our options actually are. This could include restoring to a sandbox to see which of our data uh, or which of our backups are actually infected. Um, again, back to the idea that they've been in the environment for a long time, there's a decent shot that a lot of the backups that you have, a lot of the, the system snapshots are actually infected as well and just have been archived or are just sitting in your backups for two or three months um, waiting to be restored and, and potentially reinfected. Looking at that and saying, okay, we need to restore, we need to try this in a sandbox, we need to see what's actually gonna happen. There are a lot of tools out there, um, a lot of breach response firms will do this where they can actually uh, put it into a sandbox, try to make it detonate based off of the IOCs that they have seen in the production environment, um, and then be able to uh, see how bad the, the damage really would be. This could also include, again, um, doing something like a simulation ahead of time so that you can say, hey, if it's in this part of the network, we know that there's a good chance that it's in this part as well. If they got my, uh, you know, if they got my internal uh, email server, that's bad because everything has email on it, unfortunately, these days, and boom, my entire network is down. Or I'm in this one specific area of the network that is my guest network or whatever else it is that is already partitioned off from the rest of my network. They can't get in. I feel okay about that. Having that understanding and, and looking at that ahead of time, again, can be really, really Im impactful. I would not recommend doing a ransomware simulation in the middle of a ransomware breach. Probably not your best call. Again, could just be me. And then finally, we need to make the decision of where do we want to go with this? What do we want to do? Do I want to actually negotiate? Do I think it's worth it? After we've looked at all of this stuff, is it is there a, at least a chance that I'm gonna get this data back for a price that I'm willing to pay? Again, it doesn't make sense to pay a million dollars for a $50,000 problem. Am I gonna fold? I'm gonna say, nope, nuke it, let's go. Let's, let's look at the next thing, let's just rebuild and, and start from scratch. Or am I gonna try to do it all on my own? Do I have the skills, do I have the people, do I have the partners that can actually go in and help me start looking at this and being able to take that step to get data back in a way that's not going to destroy everything I'm trying to accomplish. Those are the types of decisions that we have to make. And again, the more structure, the more of a framework, the more of a plan that we can have going in, the better off we'll be because we take out all of that emotion and all of that panic that we have in the middle of an incident. So as we go through here, we're kind of getting to the the closing argument, if you will. What are our next steps? What are the things that we should be doing in the next weeks, months, years, if you really wanna go that long, whatever? First thing that I would recommend everybody do is look at your BCP, DR, IR plans, all that stuff. Make sure it's up to date. A lot of plans that we're reviewing right now don't even account for ransomware other than a note at the top that says ransomware is bad, don't get ransomware. Thank you, Captain Obvious, appreciate that. Being able to look at those plans, understanding what we have, what our controls are, what our options are, will again help us make that decision so that we can look through and very quickly identify and say, this system was impacted, it cost me this much money, I am really screwed. Or, this system was impacted, it cost me this much money, I'm okay, I can, I can handle this. Looking at those plans, looking at that, doing a simulation, doing an impact analysis, all of that can be incredibly beneficial. If you're able to do that in the next week, congratulations, but that may be something at least to start with is looking at those plans and understanding what your current state is. In the next three months, identifying key partners. Again, this is kind of where we, we go back to, I don't want to be negotiating with a high-priced lawyer in the middle of an incident. Let's do that now when we all have the wherewithal and mindset to do it, and hopefully we can not have to pay them the extreme lawyer rates. We probably will, but we can hope, right? The other thing that I would recommend, again, technical testing. Um, when we start talking about how good are our controls, um, we had a client probably about two years ago at this point who said, yeah, we absolutely, our backups are perfect. They, we can never get hit. They're air-gapped. They're, you know, blah, 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 blah. Guess who got hit and their backups didn't actually work. Yeah, that was an awkward conversation. 
Technical testing, again, making sure that just because you know something, you actually know it, is really, really important because if you then go and make a decision, say, hey, we're not gonna pay, we're not gonna do anything, the attackers say, okay, boom, delete the encryption keys, delete the data, whatever it is, and you can't actually get that stuff back, you're gonna have some really, really mad stakeholders. So it's important for you to do that testing and understand what you have and how good it actually is. And then finally, uh, we want to be looking at how do we take our, our maturity, how do we take our defenses to the next step? So if we go from here and we say, okay, we've looked at our BCP, we've looked at our DR, we've looked at our IR, there are certain things that we know we need to do. Maybe it's more network segmentation, maybe it's more backups, maybe it's more cloud infrastructure, whatever it is, how do we do that and how do we start prioritizing that so that we are ready and again, we can reduce our chances of having to pay to get some of that vital data or operations back. So hopefully this helps everybody kind of think through the way that uh, a ransomware response can be handled. Um, as we start talking and having uh, discussions in the different uh, executive boardrooms, your manager's office, your office, whatever it is, you're able to kind of think about this and, and put it into the context that makes it easy for you to break down and go into, hopefully, a better response uh, posture. So with that, thanks everybody, I appreciate it. Um, I think we're gonna open up for a couple of minutes for questions, um, but I appreciate you guys coming out and look forward to talking with you here and so on and so forth. Yes, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, the question is, uh, how does cyber insurance play into all of this? Um, cyber insurance can be, of varying degrees, helpful. Um, some policies will actually cover ransomware payouts. Um, some will cover negotiators, things like that. So it really depends on the type of policy you have and what they are going to cover you for. Um, I will caution you if you are going to use cyber insurance, you need to be very aware of what will void your policy. Um, because for example, there are times where they say like, we won't cover you if you didn't patch all your servers within 30 days, right? Exactly, so you have to be very careful and you have to remember that if you are getting a, a negotiator or anything like that through the insurance company, they work for the insurance company, not for you. So you have to be very careful in how that relationship is set up. Mm -hmm. And typically, the very short time frame to respond mm -hmm. is usually before they change their content to an offline or a backup to a cloud policy. Mm -hmm. What is your typical time frame that you recommend to do all your negotiation and consultation? Yeah, so the question is how much time do you typically have uh, between when you basically first get contacted and then uh, when they say, okay, we're done by? Um, I hate saying it depends, but it kind of depends. Um, with some of these bigger gangs, and when we're, where we're seeing the ransomware as a service um, model that a lot of organizations are now going to, you have a little bit more time. That being said, the faster that you get in touch with them, um, the less likely they are to ghost you. You know, It's, it's kind of the same thing, right? If, if they don't think they're gonna get a sale, They'll, they'll move on to the next one. You know, they, they've got, in a lot of cases, they've got metrics, they've got managers they have to, you know, report to and, you know, have status and stuff like that. So if you just are completely silent, even for a couple of days, a lot of times they will, um, they will just move on. So it, it really is, again, the faster you can get in touch and if that's an avenue you wanna pursue, the faster you can let them know that you're willing to talk, the better off you'll be. Yeah, any other questions? All right. Oh. Uh, so, when you evaluate the probability of an actor actually mm -hmm. returning the goods and um, hacking in earnest on our payout, what does that process look like? Are you looking at, at public data? Is that all internal? What, what does that look like? Yeah. So there are um, threat intelligence companies that you can 
specifically get access to their proprietary intel. Um, and they can oftentimes uh, have access to, like, it sounds stupid, basically have access to reviews from like dark web portals, marketplaces, things like that, where they will actually have seen uh, success rates, again, reviews, things like that, um, and be able to feed that to you so that you can then make that informed decision. Um, I would typically not recommend just relying on public data because a lot of companies don't report on how much they actually got or what they actually had or, or kind of what that, um, response looked like, and so you have to be very careful with what you're actually able to see versus what's um, kind of coming straight from the source. So, right. anything else? All right, well thank you all very much. I appreciate your time. Have a great rest of your conference. <laughs>